There are lots of hidden gems, destined to be remembered fondly, only by the small number of people who played them, and they'll unfortunately be unknown by everyone else. And honestly, this is usually the fate of games made exclusively for handheld systems, unless they have a big name behind them. And one of the most notable of the unnoted is Jean d'Arc, a tactical RPG by Level 5, back when they were a developer of great PlayStation 2 titles that unfortunately did not crack the mainstream in the West. And this was right before they made something called Professor Layton and became the Level 5 most people know today. Released only in Japan and North America, since Europeans wouldn't care about a game about European history, we have a strategy game that deserves to be remembered. And if that history lesson wasn't enough, I've got another. This game, as the name implies, is a retelling of the life of the person most commonly known as Joan of Arc, a teenage girl boss from the 15th century who stood against the English during the Hundred Years' War, and she became a military leader for the French. She inspired many and angered many more because she was a girl. Some things never change. Thankfully, knowing the real history isn't a requirement to enjoy this game or its story, especially since this takes so many liberties and manages to have genuine surprises. Though for those of you with knowledge of historical events, there are lots of moments or even characters here where you can point excitedly and be happy that they're represented. Even if the real historical version of La Haya wasn't a giant talking lion, there was still a guy who he was based on. Other changes as ridiculous as that was making Jill be a sweet man instead of what he actually was. And John is depicted as cishet in this game. Starting the game, we have animated cutscenes which do their job telling us more of a story, and with a variety and scope beyond the game's usual affair of showing 3D models look at each other with text boxes filling in the rest. The inclusion of these anime scenes benefits the game immensely, and I'm surprised by the amount of them since I expected the bare minimum. But there is one potential issue here, and that is the voice acting. For the North American release of this game, we have a dub done by American actors, all doing French accents, thanks to a vocal coach they worked with. Gentle Dauphin, my name is Jeanne, La Pousselle. Oh, la you will miss you, General. If things ever get hairy again... And what could be hairier than you, my friend? <laughs> Stop this! We have no cause to hurt these people! They are Frenchmen, just as we are! How can you be so blind? Look at them! These people are trying to slaughter us! And if we lay down our swords, they win! Don't be so naive, Jeanne! It's potentially overbearing, but regardless of the quality, the lack of subtitles here is a huge flaw. For players that are hard of hearing, it's all incomprehensible. And thanks to the dub being people pretending to be French, it's also not the easiest to understand even for those of us who can hear well. And on top of that, the sound mixing is pretty awful at times, so it's even harder to understand everything than it would be with just the voices. Subtitles would have improved this for everyone, Though if you look up downloadable versions of this game on the internet, you'll see some places use an edited version, which is English, but with Japanese audio and English subtitles. Perhaps that's the version most people would want, even if the French voices are a fun touch that I don't know if I can live without. This is definitely the more accessible version if you can read well, so keep that in mind. Thankfully, the bulk of the story is done with text boxes with no vocals, regardless of which version you play, and the story is quite charming. Despite being inspired by real history, there are so many new elements here that play a large presence in the story and we get lots of surprises and subversions to what you'd expect, especially as the story progresses. All the Joan of Arc stuff here is a launching point for this fantasy war, full of demons and body possession. And this amount of freedom with this source material 
means battles can be super diverse and never tedious. It isn't just battlefields and towns against human soldiers. It's that, plus really cool locations like the interior of a noble's house, or this weird secret temple thing, or areas corrupted by hellish flesh. And the enemies include animal people, like the delightfully named Gazelle Lyaf, but we also get monsters, demons, dragons, and least friendly of all, the British. Things all start off with Henry VI. He's the child king, and he's in bed talking to the most evil-looking character alive. Not surprisingly, he turns out to be a villain, but thankfully the game spares us that twist, as this is all shown in the introductory cutscene. But we get a recap of the universe's lore. In the past, a great evil was going to take over the world, and there was a cool war with skeletons and other monsters that was tearing everything apart. But then, a small group of legendary heroes sealed away the darkness. Anyway, this evil guy, the Duke of Bedford, wants to do this all again, and he turns the child into a puppet of this great horror. And it's from there, everything escalates, and the continuing Hundred Years' War turns into one with monsters and other cool stuff. It's also at this time, Jean, her long-haired and dress-wearing protagonist, has her calm and cozy life torn apart as monsters descend upon her. Thankfully, while neither Jean or her friend Leanne are skilled combatants, Jean receives magical powers from some cool jewellery she found on a nearby corpse. An armlet? What is it? And where did it appear from? She can now magical girl transform into some kind of mythical soldier. And if the intro cutscene didn't clue you in, she is now one of the heroes of legend, just of this new generation. Instead of something like reincarnations or proving yourself, the criteria is just wearing a dead guy's stuff. With this upgrade, she can win. She feels great. She can do this. These magical apparel prove to be important because our eclectic team eventually encompasses some other people with these magical relics, as well as many other unfortunate souls who don't get magical assists. But a new emboldened Jean, after seeing her own strength, and more importantly, the destruction of her idyllic town thanks to the British and their monsters, begins her journey to unite the fractured France and defeat those English scum. But more importantly, she cuts her hair short, which is a good look on her. Unfortunately, the game opening up to demonic hell beasts does reveal Jean's mission will entail much more than bringing the French monarchy back to its position of power. This will be a long journey for her, and more importantly, the rest of the crew who I adore. Okay, mostly this dog guy, he's cute. But we also have many other fun characters, like this guy whose dialogue is written by someone who hates French accents, or this archer who sets off my gay dar. This whole cast is excellent, and I made sure to rotate them all in and out just to keep everyone competitive because I like seeing them all. And for practical gameplay purposes, some missions force you to use certain characters, so even if you hate them, it's worth keeping everyone leveled. Plus, if you just stick to the same handful of characters, you'll overlevel everything pretty quickly. Best to give every character their time in a spotlight. A problem Jean herself can run into, since she's mandatory a lot of the time, try not to overuse her, or else she'll be that level 100 Charizard in a party full of level 20s. Plus, I need that variety, because these characters all have fun dialogue for whenever they fall in battle, ranging from sad goodbyes to whoops. Though don't get worried, there is no permadeath here, so get used to these canned lines, because you can afford to be risky. In fact, it's basically required, because we have a turn limit for every stage, and you'll fail the stage if you use up too many turns. A decision that did annoy me on a couple of occasions, but I do ultimately love since it means doing more interesting runs instead of just playing it slow and safe. But back onto the characters, they all have their own unique stats and their own specific weapon choices, though there are no official classes or anything, just kind of archetypes. Each unit can be equipped with a number of skills, the total number of this increases as the game progresses, and they allow you to customize everyone a little bit. 
you can equip new special attacks or spells or give a character an inherent stat bonus. Plus their alignment in this triangle system that legally isn't a weapon triangle. Sol, Luna, and Stella operate in a system that doesn't make much sense to me but I'll roll with it. As you'd expect, one does massive damage to another and minimal to the other one. It's a very standard system, but the fact that every character here is neutral by default and they can opt into this is what makes it more interesting. And like any other skill, you can freely change or remove it, which means no one is set in stone. Every character in this game can be any one of these three types, or they can remain completely neutral, and it can be changed in between battles at no cost. It's a great way to allow customization and freedom of characters without overwhelming some players with a full job system, and best of all, it means everyone can be fluid. Your strong axe guys can be pocket healers, your thief can have elemental magic, or you can raise the evasion or defense of your primary healer. This is a great introductory system for people, and honestly it makes Jean d'Arc one of the more welcoming tactical RPGs for newcomers, and this is helped even more so by the strong and varied map design. Everything is effortless and uniquely laid out to be a memorable set piece that will constantly keep you on your toes. No two of these maps look or feel similar at all, and because this game goes from rural France to more hellish monstrosities, it means the visuals can keep on surprising. In fact, these maps being 3D isn't all just a stylish touch, but it means with our very adjustable camera, we can always get the view we need, even with these very vertical levels. As well as getting to look at small things like the great water reflections that didn't need to be included. They even did it again for this church level. It's so pretty, yet it's so needless. But back onto the map design, these are usually some variation of start on one end of the map and get to the other. And they usually break up and split into paths that encourage you to break up your own party into two or more chunks. But they manage to make the most of this framework. These levels are all phenomenal. I especially like how they never overuse cool gimmicks. Like early on we have a sealed fort where we can break down the door or use ladders to scale the walls. You'd expect that to be a constant system, but no, they don't overdo it since that would limit the map design. This isn't just a game about breaking into English forts. Though ladders and the mechanically very similar bridges are a small mechanic that does reappear on some other missions, including some optional missions on building tops. So they didn't abandon that cool gimmick outright, they just found a nice balance. And other objectives themselves share that balance too. Most missions are about defeating either all the enemies or the main commanding enemy, but we also get some nice shakeups, like get to the other side of a treacherous location, or protect a certain defenseless person, or put these lovely pet dragons back in their cages. Mission failures are just as nice, even if they're all over the place without much consistency, because Jean is required in most missions. And sometimes we'll fail a mission if she specifically falls, sometimes it's if everyone falls, and other times it's if a single person on our side falls. Or it could be entirely unrelated things, like if a certain enemy makes it to a certain point on the map. Things keep shaking up so much that this is like the grabbed by the ghoulies of tactical RPGs. I know none of you watching know what that means, but you should know what that means. Go play ghoulies. For all the faults I have with Jean d'Arc, I'd never call this game repetitive. Even optionally choosing to replay missions a second time changes the enemy lineup, as well as our starting location on some occasions. That's just a really neat extra thing they didn't have to do. Though I do have some actual problems with Jean d'Arc outside of its cutscene sound issues. Though these are all minor, it's just one of those thousand cut situations, you know? Because every character, as well as all the enemies, strengths and weaknesses are in the aforementioned triangle that's all customizable, it means we don't get the obvious visual cues if a certain character will be strong or weak against someone, so we have to hover over the unit, double check what alignment they are, and then make our move. Also, the battle pacing could be better, 
This is one of those games that would benefit immensely from a fast forward option, or even a way to skip animations. Though with that said, I do love the animations here. Like look at him fall on his butt after firing his attack. I love it. Though I could have lived with fewer sword swings. And an option to fast forward would also be very much appreciated in the menu where we combine two skill shards to make a new, more powerful one. We put shards in a frog's mouth and make new ones. It's a really cute system, but visually it wore out its welcome, even if this ugly frog never left my heart. I love him. Also, while complaining, I noticed some line formatting issues with some text. Though it wasn't that common, it was still noticeable on a couple of occasions. Uh, and I guess that's about it for issues, so let me keep slavering this game I love with even more love. Early on, we get tutorial screens, and these are super cute and show a lot of care. And this is one of those games where the character changing their weapon will also change their model. I love that stuff. The manual writers probably did too since we have a whole page for manual dedicated to weapon illustrations. Weapons, as well as armor, items, and some basic skill shards, can be found at the many stores dotted across the map. They're quaint general stores with a little bit of everything for day-to-day -day existence. We get standard swords and knives, more powerful but less accurate axes, lances that can reach further and even pierce enemies to reach ones behind them, as well as bows for long-range fun, though they can't defend when attacked directly. And there's an optional character you can go the whole game without, and she has a whip, which is pretty weak, but it has a lot of versatility in where it can reach. It's a nice balance, outside the fact that the whip is something that you can play the entire game without, and there should have been another one mandated to you. But all the units fill their niches, and combined with the customization I mentioned earlier, this is a super versatile group. The characters with magical transformation armor do get an unfair advantage, but instead of being cynical about it, I love how it allows you to maximize their use, especially for trying to keep all the non-overpowered characters viable too. Characters like Jean, Gilles, and Richard acquire SP every turn. And once enough is accrued, you can spend that to transform the characters into their more powerful forms. Initially it's just a single form for each character, but over the course of the game they get many more to use in battles. These upgrades only last a small number of turns, usually two, and during that time, not only are the character stats increased, and not only do they get a more powerful spell that they can only use during this time, they get a special unfair uber bonus called Godspeed. Whenever a transformed unit kills an enemy, they get to move and attack again on that same turn, and of course this can combo. So once again, while seemingly game-breaking, it leads to situations where your regular characters do the brute work, and then you save whichever privileged few you have to finish them off in a killing spree. Some other smaller and less fundamental bonuses can be applied to anyone you control. Burning Aura is one that occurs after you attack an enemy, a new adjacent tile will glow. If another character moves to that glowing spot and attacks, it'll do bonus damage. Neat. And on the other side, if your units are chained together in the same spot, they'll lower the amount of damage received thanks to Unified Guard. Positioning isn't just important for attacking, but defense needs it too. And it's systems like this that make the whole group come alive. They feel like an actual squadron working together instead of just individual units. There is so much to sink your teeth into here, and it doesn't just end when the credits do, since there's some post-game too, and you can spend more time playing the arena's game show, Yield or No Yield. And if all this hasn't been enough to sell you on the game, the cute frog doesn't just eat things, they fight with a sword in their mouth. This is peak gaming. And if you're one of those people who wants to play this, but isn't some kind of purist who wants their PSP games to stay at a bad resolution, there's even a fan-made 4K version that I'll link in the description. But that isn't for me. I like my games low res even when there are better alternatives. Just like the next video on Star Ocean The First Departure, 
which is a PSP remake of a Super Famicom classic, and this version received an enhanced port for the Switch and PS4, but I'm choosing to ignore, even though it fixes problems I have with the game. But don't worry, you'll find out why I still love the first Star Ocean game, and best of all, I can feel secure in the fact that it wasn't a waste of money to buy this game when there is a better and cheaper version that exists.